Yes, yes, I, I did. I did it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> no, you're, it's not you. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Snark Squad Pod, a media podcast full of friendship, feelings, and snark. I'm Nicole Sweeney. My name is Marines. And we are joined today by our friend Jocelyn. Hi, I'm Jocelyn. I have a booktube channel. It's called Yogi with a Book. I talk, obviously, about books there. You can also find me on Twitter, also talking about books, and my handle is Jossaraptor. We've invited Jocelyn here today to talk to us about the BBC slash HBO adaptation of His Dark Materials. And we've covered all three books on this podcast. So there are much more intricate synopsis of all of these books, <laughs> um, but I'm going to take you very quickly through what we get in the TV series. So we start in a world that is like ours, but in this world, humans have external souls called demons, and they manifest as these animal companions. Here we follow a young girl named Lyra Belacqua, and she's growing up am- amongst the scholars of Jordan College. Her uncle, Lord Azriel, is an explorer, and he visits Jordan with some information on his research on a particle called dust, and a theory he has that there are multiple worlds. It's a multi-verse kind of theory. So Azriel visits, and he shares all of this, but he eventually leaves again for another expedition. And even though Lyra wants to go with him, he leaves Lyra behind. The master of Jordan College decides that it's time for Lyra to leave as well and arranges for her to stay with a female explorer named Marissa Coulter. Meanwhile, children have been uh, disappearing from around Oxford, including an Egyptian boy named Billy Costa and Lyra's best friend at Oxford, Roger. The Egyptians decide that they're going to go find Billy and find the these kidnappers who are known as gobblers. In London, Lyra quickly finds that Mrs. Coulter and her golden monkey demon are the worst. They are really creepy. And we get confirmation that Mrs. Coulter is indeed working with the Magisterium as the head of the Gobblers. So Lyra runs away from Mrs. Coulter only to get kidnapped. She's rescued by Billy Costa's older brother, Tony, and Tony brings her back to the Egyptian camp. Lyra travels with them um, as they continue their journey to find the Gobblers, and they all cross pass with an aeronaut named Lee Scoresby and an armored bear named Yorick Burnison, and the Egyptians also get the witches to help their cause. They eventually do find Billy Costa, but he has been surgically separated from his demon and dies soon after they find him. Lyra is once again kidnapped, and this time she's brought to Bolvanger, where the gobblers are keeping the rest of the kidnapped children. There, Lyra finds Roger and learns what they're doing. They're cutting kids away from their demons, Lyra nearly gets Pan cut away from her, but Mrs. Coulter arrives just in time to stop the procedure. Lyra escapes from her once again, and with the help of the Egyptians, witches, and the armored bear, they destroy Bullvanger and save the remaining children. Lyra and Roger decide to continue north with Lee and Yorick, but they are attacked by cliff gas on the way. Lyra falls from the airship, survives, but is once again captured, this time by the armored bears. She uses her cunning to trick the current king of the bears, Yorfer Rachnison, into thinking that she is a demon and she could be his demon, but first he has to defeat Yorick in one-on-one ca- combat. Yorick defeats Yofer and becomes the king of the bears once again. All that's left for Lyra and Rogers to continue north and find Lord Azriel. Azriel is at first really mad that Lyra is there until he realizes that Roger is there as well, because it turns out uh, Azriel needed a kid. He needs Roger to slice away his demon and harness the energy to open a portal into another world. He does this, Roger dies, um, and Lyra ends up following her father into this other world. While all of this is happening, we're getting a concurrent story of Lord Boreal, who works for the Magisterium as well. He's looking for an explorer named Grumman, and he learns that Grumman was living in our London as a man named John Perry, who also had a wife and a son named Will. So Boreal spends the season like threatening and following them around and like breaking and entering, like that's kind of his whole deal. (laughs) And Will finds the letters from his father that Boreal is after, and he takes the letters and goes on the run, eventually finding his own portal at the very end of the season and stepping into that into another world as well. 
the end. Woo! Yay. As Mari mentioned, we have already done episodes on all three of the books. So we've kind of talked a little bit about our background with this series. And this obviously is an adaptation. Uh, and, uh, you know, we had to read all of those three books at the very least to do those podcast episodes. But uh, Jocelyn, I am curious if you I, I guess I'm not curious because I know the answer to this already. But <laughs> for the audience that does not know the answer to this already, um, what is your background with the His Dark Materials series prior to the adaptation? His Dark Materials was kind of in my holy trinity as a kid. I of things I reread. So it was this Harry Potter and A Wrinkle in Time quartet. So I read this a lot, a lot. I think I started reading it in probably like 98 or something. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. So I, I think my grandma bought the first book for me and read it with me. And then we would keep up with the series together and would talk about it. So this is one that like, it's been like two decades that I've been <laughs> with this thing. <laughs> the last time I reread was in I want to say maybe my sophomore year of college so it's actually been a while it's not as fresh in my memory but yeah I'm very excited about this because I also watched the movie in theaters when it came out <laughs> and <laughs> how, how was that for you as a childhood <laughs> fan of these books uh, <laughs> I watched it once and <laughs> I've tried to purge it completely from my brain and mostly I've succeeded actually I don't remember specifics about it that's good that's yeah. probably it's probably better that way i think so <laughs> okay moving on then to this thing to this show did you like it yes yes i did i did as well i expected i think to like it from everything that i had seen before even though the movie was super bad you could just tell i don't know i guess because it was like hbo and the cast was really great and everything that we saw beforehand i was like "Ooh, this is gonna be good um and it was indeed good and i think it was maybe even better than kind of like that baseline good that i expected it was like truly a pleasant moving experience for me and I think a really well done adaptation. Yeah, I also really loved this and like went into it primed to love it. I had some reservations because I, I think that one of the things about the movie is that the cast of that movie is flawless. Like the one person who really did their job is the casting director. Uh, like, I think it was a really well cast movie for the most part. And so like as I kept seeing cast announcements, I was like, well, yeah, this cast looks great, but I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> We've been burned before. Um, but I, I also like had pretty high hopes just because it's a show rather than a movie and like, you know, just giving the story more space and time. I also think having non American production team, um, because I think one of the big flaws of the movie was trying to strip it of its like controversial messaging. Uh, like, I think it, it left it very hollow. Uh, and empty. And so, yeah, I, I all around had pretty high expectations. They were generally met. Like I, I for the most part, really enjoyed this. So uh, I guess we're going to just make our way then through this cast of characters. How did you guys feel about Daphne Keene as Lyra? I thought she was pretty great. I think she mostly got the sort of Lyra that has been living in my head for so many years. <laughs> and she was just like really sweet. I love that she was like kind of tall too. <laughs> she has so many really wonderful little moments. And I think one of the things about adapting this that is tricky is that you have obviously all of these child protagonists and that means that you then need to have child actors who can really carry this. And she had a couple really, really lovely moments that felt incredibly Lyra and this is like a mixture of both the writing and the performance. Like I think credit goes in both directions, but something that really stands out to me is the moment where she's fighting with Ma Costa and about, you know, nobody tells her anything and, you know, how am oh, I supposed bridge. to trust anybody? Yeah. Yes. That whole bit. Like right when, when Ma Costa tells her who she, who they are to each other, basically sort of shares that kind of that whole background with her. And she has this line where she screams, basically Ma Costa is like, I, you know, I can't tell you that or whatever, something along those lines. And she screams back, I'm so bored of being told that. And I just <laughs> was so struck by it because it is such a like Lyra thing to say. I don't know, like that to me, like that doesn't feel like the most logical or obvious, you know, response, like thing that you would write, but it's the most Lyra thing to, to sort of both write in response to that. And then also just the way that she delivers it, the 
angry, indignant way that she says that she is so bored of being told that. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> there are so many <laughs> lovely, charming little moments like that that stand out to me. I would die for fiction for book Lyra, and I also would die for Daphne Keene's Lyra, <laughs> in conclusion. <laughs> I think it took me a little while to warm up to this version of Lyra. I think in my head, Lyra lives a little bit younger, mm-hmm. I think, than what we, than what Daphne Keene, like Daphne Keene has a very like mature presence. And and Lyra definitely gets that way. But I think when you meet Lyra, like running around the halls of Jordan College, there is like a bit of a playfulness and like a mischievous air that I, I at first didn't see in Daphne Keene. And so I was like, oh, no, like, this isn't my like, you know, my bad liar, little Lyra, you know, jumping from roof to roof. But it was almost more important that they got an actress who could handle the majority of it, which is, you know, bad stuff happens. And this woman or this child is like facing down adults. And like you, you really need needed somebody who you would believe that all of these adults kind of surround and champion and are like going to give their lives for. And so I think Daphne Keene did that like dramatic stuff very, very well. So it was easy for me to forgive that at the very beginning, I wasn't entirely there. Um, And yes, now at the end of it, I'm with everybody else who would die for Lyra. (laughs) (laughs) Correct. (laughs) So say we all. (laughs) The next most logical place to move on is to... Lyra's parents. Uh, how did you guys feel about James McAvoy as Lord Asriel? Weird. <laughs> <laughs> I, because I like him as an actor and I've always found him like very charming and just like straight out the bat. I mean, he he was the father pretty good. He was just like a straight up dick. And I was like, whoa, calm down, James <laughs> McAvoy. Like, <laughs> Okay. Um, I So I guess he did deliver he was a little melodramatic for me in places where i didn't think he needed to be like in the end Mm -hmm. when he seems sees roger and he's just like oh you i was like (laughs) okay that was not necessary (laughs) yeah um this is completely unfair to james mcavoy who's had like a long and brilliant career i'm sure but he's always mr tumness to me which is from like my (laughs) other like childhood i was waiting for that yeah (laughs) sorry it's like my other like childhood thing and he was in that adaptation so whenever he's not just like a loving beautiful fawn I'm like what are you even doing Um, (laughs) to (laughs) to give credit where credit is due yes Lord Asriel's such a sucky character like the worst meant to be Mm -hmm, almost mm -hmm. I guess whatever he yeah he is the worst and as I was watching him, I was like, wow, you are the worst. So I guess James McAvoy did a good job. Um, <laughs> was, you know, he's kind of, he's missing from the middle chunk of this. We see him at the beginning and then again at the end. Like those are his like major um, points. So when we're at the end where Lyra finally gets to him and she's confronting him about being her, her father or whatnot, <laughs> that entire back and forth, just my heart. It was it was really tough to watch her come to terms with the fact that she went through this whole journey for somebody who does not care. But also I I felt like he he sold it as well in terms of like being single minded and focused on one thing. And yeah, he he gives a good deadbeat dad is what I'm saying. <laughs> yeah, he was also one of the things that I was particularly nervous about before the show started airing, because a lot of the trailers focused on his bit like his sort of section of the story to a degree that worried me a little bit and i i spent our three podcast episodes about the books yelling about this about my belief that he is philip pullman's like self-insert character so the fact that pullman um was executive producing this that was my other sort of big anxiety i was like oh god they're gonna rewrite asriel into being (laughs) like uh, whatever they're they're gonna try to give him yes try to give him more of like a hero edit uh and i was i was kind of concerned about that i understand now why they chose the sort of clips that they did for the trailer in part because his sort of his stuff does bookend the season as you just pointed out but it also i think is the simplest 
uh, in terms of giving like the layout and the structure of this season of like the story that we're telling this season. And now he's kind of, I don't know, he's, he's done the essential bit that he needs to do until he comes back around later. So, um, I, yeah, it, it all makes sense to me now. I'm just, I'm reiterating what my like anxieties and reservations were going into it. I think that the he is a character who sucks and it in addition to the fact that he sucks he also has to be very charming like that's a necessary he has to be this like good looking charming guy in order to do all the things that he does in order to like manipulate people in the ways that he does uh and so i just all of those things i think were were well represented here. I was constantly afraid that they were going to try to make me like him. And I was pleased <laughs> <laughs> that we didn't get that. <laughs> uh, we caught back around to the all important fact that he's a deadbeat dad who murders a little boy. So fuck Lord Asriel. Uh, what did you guys think of Ruth Wilson as Mrs. Coulter? Uh, I think Ruth Wilson maybe stole the show. I think that yes. she gave by far like the best performance of this entire series and I was surprised I feel like maybe this was like residual leftover of like you know Nicole Kidman playing her in the movie and that being like really brilliant casting and Ruth Wilson she's was not who I imagine when I think of Mrs. Coulter mm-hmm. but I just think that her, like, watching her on screen, whenever she was in a scene, she was absolutely magnetic. And obviously, this is a super complex character. And I feel like through her interpretation and through watching it, I... I learned things about this character yes. or I saw this character in a new way. And, and I kind of felt like I was digging deeper into like her motivation and who she was as a character, which is wild to me after having reread the book so many times and having so much more material that an interpretation from like a brilliant actress could open up the character in this way. So, I mean, again, just a really complicated but awful character because she was also kidnapping children and essentially killing them. But I, I feel so bad for her. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't know. <laughs> her portrayal of this character, I think I agree with everything that you are saying. Like it really did affect the way that I think about and see and understand this character in a way that is really interesting and genuinely surprising to me as somebody who has read these these books so many times. And like I came to them for the first time right after I graduated from college. So when I say I've read them so many times, like I read them a lot as an adult when I was like thinking through and like really picking them apart in that kind of way. And so to have this experience of watching this show and feeling like I was getting to see another angle and another side of this character was really genuinely surprising um, in in like a great way and really interesting and cool. And I think that everything about Ruth Wilson's um, performance, like it filled the Lena Headey sized void in my soul, like (laughs) post (laughs) post Game of Thrones. She had some really incredible, incredible turns. The, The bit in the Oh, gosh, I, I'm like picturing in my head like an interrogation room, but that's not quite what it is. But it's she's at the magisterium and there's this bit where like Father McPhail, um, he thinks that he's like going to give her a talking to. And like the <laughs> way that she turns that turns it in that scene, there's just so much going on in Ruth Wilson's delivery. And that like five minute span, it is just chef's kiss perfection. I also think there's a lot of really, really great stuff with her and her demon. I think this is mostly mm. where I would say that like watching this adaptation has affected the way that I think about and understand this character. This again is both performance and like the actual writing of the character too, but the the ways in which they portray the dynamic between her and the golden monkey is really interesting. It was not until watching this that it ever even occurred to me that the golden monkey doesn't have a name and never says anything yeah. like that this is that like mm-hmm. this is a major character whose soul we never get a name or a single line of dialogue from there there is literally no other comparison with a character even comparably as significant to the story as her to have their demon not get a name or get a single line of dialogue um and there are just so many small moments in the ways in which she is 
abusing her own soul basically mm-hmm, mm-hmm. like i i don't know i there 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 is just so much to unpack i i could do a whole hour long podcast episode <laughs> just about ruth wilson's mrs coulter is basically what i'm saying uh, yeah i could too <laughs> i think <laughs> <laughs> I, I think I wrote down that she was like beautiful and terrifying, which has just always been my impression of Miss Coulter in general. I mm-hmm. always loved her in the books. I, I I was always way more afraid of her and way more, I guess, also impressed by her than even Lord Asriel. I was just like, this is a bitch who knows what she wants. And it's <laughs> scary. <laughs> and also like even... Besides just her amazing performance and just like all of the tiny nuances, I also think that the casting like visually was really good because the bone structures between her and I already forgot her name. The girl who plays Lyra is actually pretty similar. So I was like, Lyra, how do you not see that's going to be you (laughs) in like 20 years? (laughs) Come on, girl. (laughs) I loved the the scenes that uh, Ruth Wilson and Daphne Keene had together. Uh, The the one that stuck stuck with me is when they are at Bullvanger and and Lyra has managed to trick uh, Mrs. Coulter again and like basically locks her in a room and they're both yelling at each other Mm. through the door (gasps) but it's kind of like the sound has been removed but you can just see the way that they're both like expressing this anger and I was just like oh man Um, again the performance beautiful and I think one of my like biggest complaints is almost um, how they use the demons in this um, because I think that there was something a little bit missing there with the exception of the golden monkey and Mrs. Coulter, because as Nicole said, it was just the the way that they express like the self hate through that was really interesting. And I think that we always kind of got Lord Azriel's motivations in the book, I think a little bit more defined where he's coming from. He's he's on a righteous war path, right? But there was something about the way that they kind of explored Mrs. Coulter's past and her trauma, I guess, and just how very much she um, sometimes does not like herself and and, and how that like translate into everything that she does. So um, again, we could do a whole hour about how great <laughs> Ruth Wilson is. I have a lot of feelings. I also want to agree on that demon point. That was something that was my biggest complaint of the series too. It's just like the demons were very underutilized which i understand from like a cgi and like spending and just like the amount of work that has to go into like making these animals but i was like like seven-year-old me was very upset (laughs) (laughs) i mean apart from just like the demons are freaking cool and i want to see them all the time i think it's like integral to the story to understand like the relationship between a person and their demon Mm -hmm. and the fact that they're like always there and so the fact that we had scenes where i would be like where's pan you know yes it just the the demons were like like absent for chunks of time it just it took something away from the story and it made me wonder like people who are watching it for the first time obviously when you have like kids in cages and they were doing the like the the you know, intercision or whatnot, they're chopping away their demons. You're going to have feelings because that's a kid and this kid is crying and like, obviously this is very upsetting. Right. But there's also this like piece of it that's like, okay, you're trying to chop somebody's soul off that I wasn't sure that the the story fully conveyed um, because the the demons were kind of missing um, from, from it. So, I mean, maybe it is just that I wanted to see the cool animals all the time, but I feel like there's something more there. No, I, I totally agree. I think two things. One, I think it was really interesting the way that they introduced the idea of the golden monkey being able to go away from Mrs. Coulter. Maybe I'm like wrong and I just don't remember this. I do not remember that being a thing in the books. And I think that that's like an interesting thing for the show to introduce, especially given like where we're going long term. Like that's something that I think is Mm -hmm. interesting given the way that the books explore demons, like that there is something that's really interesting there. But because they didn't seed enough about what the demons mean. I don't know. Like, I don't know if they're actually going to explore that in a way that is sort of interesting and meaningful. Um, Even though obviously we have all read the books and we've done all the episodes about the books, I'm trying to keep this like contained to 
the the show <laughs> and like and avoid um i guess i don't know avoid making this like book spoiler conversation but i just given given some things that are going to happen that happen like in the series i think that there are potentially some really interesting parallels to draw with that but i don't know if that idea is actually ever going to be there because they didn't really introduce the demons properly um but more than that my bigger concern and and uh, to agree with everything that's been said the way in which they changed the Tony Macarios slash Billy Costa plotline, like I totally fine. I get why they they subbed out Tony Macarios for Billy Costa. That made sense to me. Um, I, the, the second that I realized that they were going to do it in the first episode, I was like, oh, no, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is this is where we're going with that. Huh? Uh, they even gave Billy Costa even named his, his demon ratter. Uh, like this is this is clearly what we're going to do um, like that. That substitution, I understand, like collapsing the number of characters cool i'm on board but that scene in the books so for anybody who is happening to be listening to this conversation without having read the books and you've only seen the show uh that scene is like meaningfully different in the books uh, lyra does go find tony who's the little boy that she finds it's not billy costa but she goes off on her own because the the alethiometer tells her to so she goes off to find this little boy he is clutching desperately to a dead fish that he is calling Ratter and insisting is his demon um, or he's asking after his demon rather um, but he's he's holding on to the, clutching onto this fish and so Lyra decides to rescue this boy she takes this boy who like back to the camp and nobody knows this boy so I a little bit get why they're doing things why you know they made some some choices because Billy Costa is known to the group that she's with but this boy is unknown and everybody in the group basically is like horrified by this child who has no demon uh and yorick is like get your shit together you are grown men this little girl you like she was brave you you owe it to her to also be brave um but then there's a he he ends up dying in the night because he like can't survive like this and there's like an additional scene where somebody eats the fish and lyra yells at them rightly so because she's like that was super fucked up like this was this was all he had whatever i don't know but there's there's a lot there okay with the the demons that i think matters both in terms of what all of that does for the characterization of lyra and like for her uh like her one of her defining positive attributes is her bravery and so like that's really i think is important for all of that but it's also really really important to helping people understand to helping the audience understand the the significance of the demon connection and i just like i <sighs> so much of that was lost like i don't know like that scene was incredibly moving like ma costa the uh Anne marie duff who plays ma costa was phenomenal um in terms of like portraying all of that grief and and whatnot but i so 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 much was lost i think in terms of helping the audience understand the significance and the weight of the demon thing it to going back to mari's point mostly just reads as this is sad because children are being hurt but like mm -hmm. it's it is, it is not given the full weight the way that it exists within this world yeah and i think that's also like the demons are not very present at all when they do bring billy back and they're like where's his demon and i was like I don't see half of you guys as demons. How do they like, <laughs> how are you immediately picking this up? Uh-huh. I was like, I've seen like three demons this entire show. I don't, mm -hmm. I don't understand. Mm -hmm. And I was also like really mad that Pan didn't change very much. Like if nothing else to like talk about, because Lyra's like innocence and childhood is obviously like a very important part to this story and this series. And Pan, like, switching shape and, like, them trying to figure out who they want to be is huge. And so the fact that he was, like, either a Martin or a Snow Fox, like, 80% of the time, 
very up, uh, very much upset me. And I'm, yes. I know it's like a very small thing, but I was like, no, <laughs> it's just wrong. <laughs> well, because it's another bit of like world building around the demons that like this again is a thing with Lyra that like because she is super creative and imaginative, like her demon also you know bounces around to all of these really like creative forms and this is a thing sometimes that like when she encounters other children in the books that like this is a like that we see it that we see her demon we see pantalaimon take on more clever shapes and then when she goes to uh bullvanger and like she knows she's gonna play this part and she's not playing the part of like her actual self that she has this moment of oh this girl is like is is not as clever as me <laughs> and so and part of being <laughs> less clever is that my demon is gonna have to be less interesting and less active and like whatever and i just it's frustrating mm-hmm. I, like i it's frustrating because all of this shit with the demons is so much a part of the point <laughs> of this right. plot line like it's not this is not just a question of oh you left out these things that i like from the book like i, I don't care that it's any of these specific details like i'm naming them because they are the, like the details that I know but like the point isn't any of those details it's that like this shit about the demons matters because the whole Mm -hmm. fucking season is about the magisterium cutting away kids demons Mm -hmm. so like uh, I need this context and the the fact that it matters is only like the highlight is that they did it well with Mrs. Coulter and so the Mm -hmm. fact that you know we got so much from that character because of that interaction with her and her golden monkey which was always around you're like yes correct Mm -hmm. this this is what you were supposed (laughs) to be doing for everyone (laughs) so you almost feel the absence a little bit more because they got it right one time. <laughs> In the same way, I, again, like not not to like be like this was missing from the book, but this was kind of missing from the book for me. And I don't know if it was it felt the same for you guys, but in the same way, I wanted to see more of Pan. I would have liked to see more of the alethiometer, or at least understanding a little bit more like what it meant for Lyra to instinctively know how to read this and how she read it. Like a lot of times she would just open it and be like, where's Yorick? And it would like start spinning. And I'm like, no, (laughs) she's got to enter information in there. (laughs) Like she, you know, that was like the give and take of it, um, which they did not communicate well, I don't think. I don't know. How'd you guys feel? (laughs) I think they tried. There was that one scene with... (laughs) There was that one scene with John Fa and uh, Serafina Piccolo's ex, who I don't remember his name right now. <laughs> he was just like, she can read it without the books. But then they like <laughs> cut right off of that. So I was like, oh, OK, I guess that's that's all the information we're getting <laughs> <Right>. on that. <laughs> yeah, they talk about it a, a, a couple of times. Like they definitely do acknowledge multiple adult characters. Like I, I, I feel pretty confident that even if you haven't read the books, that you understand the idea that she that she is doing something that is like weird that it's not you know a known thing um uh mrs coulter also says it when she goes to jordan college she says something about how about the books whatever like the books come up a number of times um but uh, yes to to marie's point we're not like as an as the audience we're not given any sort of real understanding of that dynamic beyond like this is a kind of weird and magical thing that she can do my um actual sort of annoyance with this with the alethiometer stuff isn't that um it's the the whole like this is so illegal plot line um that I, so I haven't read the most recent book in the the new trilogy but there are a number of things about the first book uh in the the book of dust series or whatever that felt kind of retconny and mm. it, it, some of it is like the the way in which the magisterium is presented uh and like the alethiometer thing felt in line with that like uh, the books never sell us on this vibe that lyra needs to keep it a secret because it's super illegal it's more like it's very precious and you don't know who to trust and when the master is giving her the the alethiometer he can't outright tell her don't trust mrs coulter but like don't fucking trust mrs coulter it's like (laughs) i don't know like all of that is the is sort of what's going on in the books and i just i don't know it's not a serious grievance because i don't think it actually you know meaningfully impacts the story in any kind of way but it was a thing that just 
left me with the sense of, okay, but why? Why did you? Why are we doing this? (laughs) So I just mentioned the master and I do want to kind of cycle through some of the supporting characters. I think anytime that you're talking about a book adaptation, the like roster of supporting characters is going to be so much more important because obviously in the books, like we spent so much more time with these characters. So there's, you know, more, more supporting characters that matter. I really loved Clark Peters as the master. This was another character that I thought more about and more like complexly about because of the way that it was portrayed in the adaptation. I am a little bit sad that we didn't get the exchange between him and the librarian about how it's the duty of the old to fret about the young. Um, Hmm. That's one of my favorite lines of the book. So I was a little sad. I was like, the the moment is here. You have it. It Just just say it. Just say the thing. Um, But I, I just like really felt for this man and how much he clearly loves this child that was placed into his care. And that's it. That's all I wanted to say is that I just really loved him. (laughs) I have my shout out's going to be for Amir Wilson as Will Perry. Mm, yes. <sighs> Beautiful. <laughs> as I was um, putting together the synopsis, I was like, oh, wow. Like that whole storyline was so easy to summarize because not a lot happened. You know, we we're watching kind of the, the slow back and forth between Lord Boreal, who is like being, you know, threatening or whatnot, and then Will coming to terms or trying to understand his mom and what else is happening there. But also just like how he, I don't know, he's taking care of his mom. He's trying to figure out what's going on. Watching him at school and like, you know, all of those little small interactions immediately just made me invested in this boy's story. And so by the time that he's on the run at the end, I I feel like they did a good job of teasing that out so that when we come back for a second season, and, like our hearts are already there and he 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 had the sort of like you know maturity that I think book will had where you believed that this kid yes was taking care of himself was taking care of his mom um, and he did a great job yeah I think there were a lot of really great supporting actors I'm gonna have my shout out be to Harry Melling who is Dudley Dursley and also <laughs> Sisselman <laughs> <laughs> it's it's just good to know that he continues to be like just a snot nosed jerk. I, I found that actually quite great. So while we're talking about supporting characters, we, we also have to discuss uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda as Lee Scoresby. How did you guys feel about that casting choice and his performance? I was confused. <laughs> um, he came in it felt like real fast and hard with like a Southern accent. Like he was supposed to be like this gunslinger and then it, he lost it halfway Mm -hmm. through the episode and never picked it back up. And I was like, where, where did that go? (laughs) Uh, He was okay. I guess he wasn't my favorite version of Lee for sure, but the accent really threw me off. So at at some point, I don't know, a couple months before the the show started, I was on my friend Nick Jenkins's podcast talking about the movie adaptation. And I did not know this, but somebody on that episode mentioned that somebody, I think Phil, Philip Pullman, had originally wanted Samuel L. Jackson to be Lee Scoresby. And ever since hearing this, I can't like, I can't unhave that as like, <laughs> like, because the thing about this character is that like, he is supposed to be this badass who then has secretly has big dad energy. Like, mm-hmm. <laughs> like thing one is he's like fucking cool. Like he's really cool. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And then he's mm-hmm. like, oh, I actually love this little girl as if she were my own daughter. And I am her dad now. <laughs> like, and like, and then we get to that. Uh, so I, one, I'm just really sad that we never got to see Samuel L. Jackson as a <laughs> score is, is, uh, there's that. I don't know. I have mixed feelings about. Lynn Manuel Miranda as Lee Scoresby. It makes me sad to have mixed feelings about it because, again, this was on the long list of things that I was like really hopeful about. I don't think he could, I just don't think he sells the like the badass half of this character. Like he just, he's all dad energy. <laughs> there's no, there's no this guy will fuck you up energy coming from him. <laughs> so like there, there's that. Um, but I, I think that he had a number of really lovely and sweet moments with Daphne Keaton 
2018. And so I think that like, I, I don't know, like that is 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 worth something um, in the like the way that I think about and evaluate this performance. But um, I don't know. I have mixed feelings. Yeah, same. And it, it, it sucks because I, I like Lin-Manuel Miranda. I love Lee Scoresby as a character and that interaction between them of like the substitute dad, like, you know, Lyra ends up with like 17 substitute dads. Yes. It's great. Um, but he's like, a, a and she really deserves great one. them all. She <laughs> deserves each and every one of them. Um, so as you said, those moments were like great, but his, his performance was about as uneven as his delivery of his accent, whatever that was. Supposed to be. <laughs> like there, there were moments that I was like, no, baby, no. What am I watching? Um, <laughs> Um, it is, it was just a little bit unfortunate. I think with a little, a clearer direction, like they should have maybe just scrapped the whole like gunslinger thing or Mm -hmm. just, I don't know, maybe gone a completely different direction, but they tried to keep enough of the original character that it felt uneven to me. Um, yeah, I, I just, even at the end where, He's like throwing a tantrum kind of because he crashed. And then Serafina Pekala comes along and it's just like, yeah, it's not over yet. I'm like, what? I don't know. This scene just feels tacked on. And a lot of the things that he did felt that way. And I just weren't wasn't completely sold when he was on screen. They have him playing at times more of sort of like a like a silly sort of character and i agree mm-hmm. that i think that if they had leaned more just just said that's the character that's how we're going to write this character i think because it seems kind of like they wanted him to play this part more than than anything else so like fine like adapt the part accordingly mm-hmm. rather than <laughs> trying to force him into the the gunslinger part that just didn't didn't really work that well but i also want to now discuss one of her other 19 dads my favorite mm-hmm. dad mm-hmm. Yorick Bernison. Yeah. Um, <laughs> number one dad. Mm. A bear. Uh, yeah. He was never uneven. He was consistent. Yes. He was wonderful. <laughs> he was always wonderful. <laughs> I think some of the moments where maybe like, I, this is kind of weird to say, I wasn't like cheering the entire time <laughs> by myself in my apartment, but there were a number of times that I had like a, and like an audible, like, yeah, reaction. Uh-huh. Action, and they usually came because of something Yorick. Yes, mm-hmm. I mm-hmm. genuinely, on multiple occasions, like had had a like loud. This is me alone in my apartment, just like an un, not like on purpose. It just like came out. It's like yes, <laughs> <laughs> Time reaction, and it was always because of Yorick. Like that's the the only thing that triggered that for me was Yorick. Mm-hmm. I just want to yell bears all bears. the time. <laughs> yeah, that was I did that the, the first trailer that it was like next time on. I did I did yell bears. <laughs> Yeah, I cried when he (laughs) dubbed her Lyra Silvertongue. Well, because also Mm. it had been so long since I've read the story. Like she's kind of lived in my memory as Lyra Silvertongue. I've forgotten that she's like technically Lyra Balakwa. So when he gives her his her name, I was just like, oh my god, this is it. (laughs) (laughs) It's so beautiful. (laughs) (laughs) The world makes sense again. So we've kind of talked a little bit about the ways in which they have changed some threads, moved some, shuffled some things around here, but I... I guess I, like I want to talk about that more directly. So talking about this as an adaptation, p- perhaps most significantly of all, the entire Will Perry plot line is the mm-hmm. beginning of the second book uh, in the trilogy. And, you know, we get that stuff in this first season, uh, which otherwise Lyra's story in this first season is beginning to end the first book. Uh, and then we get sort of Will's story later. They shuffled some stuff around with that. B- most of this Lord... Lord Boreal stuff is is sort of an invention of the show. I, I don't know. Maybe yes and no. I guess it's it's sort of assumed. It's implied that this stuff was happening kind of off screen. Uh, we we never we never heard about him doing anything to, to this effect. Um, but we do in the books later meet him in our world, and it's 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 implied that he has had a whole life back and forth. Um, but anyway, so how did you guys feel about? The, the just this as an adaptation and the ways in which they kind of shuffled the story around. I think for me, my main like 
complaint. Complaint is a strong word. But the main thing that I've always said about the first book was that the first 100 pages were a little slow. And I've heard from other people who have tried to get into the book that complaint as well, that it takes a little while for the story to get moving. And it takes a while for some people to get invested in Lyra as a character. And that it's around the time that she joins the Egyptians. And she's like, with them and trying to find the kidnappers and also lying to them a little bit. And they're like, no girl, that they're like, oh, okay, finally, Lyra. But it it does get off to a slower start just because there's a lot of world. And Philip Pullman like really takes his time introducing it to you. Um, so I think that as soon as I realized that they were speeding some things along and taking some elements of book two and putting them in book one, you know, there's always that like moment of like holding your breath to see what's going to happen. But I think it made so much sense for the pacing of a TV show Mm -hmm. to do what they did. Um, I think that, as I said, I, I feel like we got that introductory piece here in season one so that when we get to season two, like our, our feelings are already there for Will. Like we're already understanding what what the story is going to like when it converges. What's you know we're expecting what's going to happen. So I thought it made a lot of sense, and there wasn't really anything um, in terms of, of a, at least the timelines that I I feel like I could have done without. I think that it worked for me for the most part. Yeah, I I was really surprised when the Will stuff started coming in. It was like what episode three or four maybe. I was like oh. Oh, we're doing this now. Cool. Also, because I didn't remember Will having a mother. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) I'm sure he had to have someone, but I just had did not remember her like as a person. I don't know if they completely fabricated her just to give him more backstory or not. But I was like, oh, this is actually kind of nice, like getting to see domestic Will and like what his life is. But their house, I'm sorry, their house was way too expensive for the amount of money that the dad is apparently spending <laughs> sending back. No, I, I could not deal with that. <laughs> Aside from uh, outlandish wealth, <laughs> I, I will say that the the portrayal of his mother does feel pretty true to what we get in the books. Like I think he he's he gets very little time with her before he goes off on his journey, but it is pretty much you know, what we saw of of the, that dynamic in the books. Her character is another one that like getting to see it on screen affected me. I think of her mostly as a character that Will thinks about. Like her character in the books to me is more how Will is thinking about her. And so getting to see her be a whole entire human being that like an actress had to put all of that thought into how she was going to carry her uh, I was really it was really cool. It was it was something that I was really like glad to get to see. Uh, and I just agree with everything that Mari had to say about how the pacing of this just made so much sense to me uh, for the, the sake of a TV show. Like, I think there's like a certain shock value, I guess, in the reveal, the way that it hits in the books. That to me is not really a compelling reason to stick to it. Like, I, I also think that it, it, the structure of the timeline in the books makes sense for a written story. (laughs) But I think Mm -hmm. that when you're adapting it to the screen, like this kind of shuffling made a lot of sense, like both for keeping the pace moving. Um, I I think it was still shocking in the context of the show when we first see Lord Boreal step out into our sort of London, like they, they shot it a little bit differently, like the cinematography felt Mm -hmm. different um and so and that was like a weird and jarring moment and so i think like it still landed in that kind of way i also think that because this is a tv show and like yes it's more time than a movie but it is still ultimately not the same amount of time and the same i don't know quality of time i guess that you spend with the characters when reading the books i don't feel great about describing it that way but it's the it's the <laughs> it's what came to it's what came out uh i will maybe think of a better way to say it later and be upset with myself for saying it that way now but what i mean is mostly that the books because they are hundreds and hundreds of pages, we can spend that whole first book with just Lyra and then start the second book and meet Will there um, and and spend all that time in his head and like 
hearing how he thinks and hearing it's just mostly just hearing this little boy think about how much he loves his mom uh, <laughs> does a lot right. to, for the reader to help the reader say okay this new kid I love this new kid too I will also die for this new kid he's great and, and I think that that's harder on a TV show when you don't get all of that inner monologue um, I think that it, it is a lot harder to do that and so it also makes a ton of sense to me that we introduced Will in the first season for that reason just because the two of them are so important long term like they're sort of this is this ultimately becomes their journey together when they eventually get together i guess that's i broke my rule and that's my one spoiler <laughs> i feel <laughs> like if you watch this whole first season and you don't know these two kids are gonna meet like that's on you for being really bad at tv <laughs> Like, that's clearly where we're headed. Uh, and I think like it was important to let audiences get to know him a little bit um, and not have us spend so much time with Lyra before we meet him that we are not able to care about them similarly, I guess. The one other thing that I um, have in our little notes here to comment on as being great is the opening credits. That's the whole thought. The opening credits are great. Oof. <laughs> I wrote down I hated them. <gasps> Ooh! <laughs> okay, okay. Uh -huh. Tell uh -huh. me more, Jocelyn. <laughs> I watched it the first time through, and then I skipped it every time after. <laughs> oh, no, that hurts me so much. <laughs> well, well, actually, like, the thing that I wrote down is that it was, like, really like I was like oh yeah HBO definitely put this out because it was really reminiscent to Game of Thrones I was like this intro why why is it the same it was very Westworldy to me almost I think it was something about the score that made it feel that way too um but I loved it I don't care give, give me that that credit <laughs> sequence on every single TV show it's like a rom-com with a Game of Thrones opening and I'd be like cool <laughs> <laughs> I loved it. I just, I, I think it was like something about it that was like so layered that really captured like the entire thing that it is like a multiverse. It was dramatic and beautiful and it had like the quality of like the dust in there. And I, I loved the score throughout. So I was in. Yeah, I didn't mind the visuals, but the score actually was the one thing I was like, I cannot listen to it. <laughs> <laughs> actually the, uh, the score great. in general in the the story sometimes like there were only a couple of things that i guess reminded me like oh yeah like this is a story that like children can partake in like this is a book that's written for children and it was like sometimes the score was like really like feel sad now <laughs> and then also uh lynn manuel miranda i was like he's acting for a children's show right now yes I, he's no, the only one yeah the only I, one though yeah. yes Yes, I totally agree with that. I think that that is part of the the unevenness of of that performance too. Is that there mm -hmm. were a number of moments where it was like, "You are the only one who decided that we were doing a, a kids show," and everybody else is like, "Cool, we're doing an HBO show." Yeah, like, <laughs> but like you guys didn't all didn't all get together on that one beforehand. <laughs> So. There should have been a memo. <laughs> <laughs> Something else in my notes that I wanted to gush about is how much I loved Roger. Aww. What his whole dynamic with Daphne Keene. I don't think that that child actor was quite as good as Daphne Keene, but I think that they had some really like their moments together made her character better. <laughs> like I, I think that they helped sell, they helped Daphne Keene sell Lyra. By the end, when they were just hugging all the time, it was like a sob fest for me. I was just like, oh, they're just going to keep hugging. I know where this is going. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, the first time he comes on the screen, I was like, oh, no. <laughs> you're so cute and small and you're going to die. Yeah, I was just like, oh, no. Oh, no. It's coming. And like every time she's like, let's go find Roger. I'm like, you don't you don't want to do that, though, really. You don't. <laughs> Oh, the other thing I made a note of was I really liked whoever did the wardrobe and costume design. I thought mm. it was like beautiful. Like when Serafina came up in that like gauzy green. Oh, my God. It was <laughs> gorgeous. <laughs> yeah. And I even liked the way Miss Coulter always looked impeccable just like these really clean lines and like these really powerful like gem tones. I love the way that they use the costumes to also, like when Lyra is with Miss Coulter to like sort of show 
their relationship and like how she's like mm-hmm. trying to get, dress her like her. And then even like when they go up north separately, both of their coats echo each other. Like they look very similar, which I thought was just a really interesting touch. Like the cut is very similar and the color is very similar. I don't know. There were like a lot of very smart choices that felt like I knew also that I'm in Lyra's world, but it doesn't look there wasn't anything like over the top, like hokey, like this is a fantasy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I just it was awesome. I really, really liked the costume design. It was uh, super interesting to me because she is always impeccable, except for after Bullvanger, she's got like a small cut underneath her chin. Mm. And it's like, you know, her entire world literally just imploded. And then she's got a little, little, little cut. <laughs> just like, that's great. <laughs> it is the most Mrs. Coulter thing I've ever seen. Um. <laughs> the last sort of note that I want to like end this on is obviously the show has been picked up for a second season they are it's already in production i don't know if it's currently in production or if it's already wrapped yet but that is a thing that's going to happen um very excited about that what are the things that you are most looking forward to seeing like what are what what are you hoping for in this in this second season Kind of going off of what Jocelyn was just saying about like the costume design and the way that they made Lyra's Oxford feel very different. Mm -hmm. I'm excited to see like them, how visually we're going to get this next world that they're going into. Mm -hmm. Um, I I, like, I want to see it. I want to see it on the screen because I mean, we only got the one movie that was awful and obviously they never (laughs) made anymore. So this is the first time that we're really getting to see it interpreted. Mm -hmm. So I think that'll be really cool. And then of course, because I already gushed about loving Will, um, Lyra and Will together. Yes. Let's do it. (laughs) Yeah. Also very much. Lyra and Will, I always really, really loved their dynamic, uh, and it would—it's just going to be really great to see them interact and to see those actors next to, to each other mm-hmm. and seeing how they play off each other too, because they—they they don't interact at all. And Will's character that we get here is quite withdrawn. He actually doesn't say that much in this whole like first season Uh uh-huh and lyra obviously is like the main player and says a lot so i don't know just putting them (laughs) together (laughs) seeing how they're gonna share the screen i'm i'm very interested to that i feel both like yes i cannot wait to see just sort of the moments uh so you know putting will and lyra together uh i am curious to see whether my feelings about Lin Manuel Miranda's Lee Scoresby changed now that we are moving into the like full dad part of his character, part of his arc. Sure. Uh, um, you know, to see see where that goes. Uh, so there's like that kind of stuff that I'm excited about. But I think I love these books for so many reasons. But like the reason that this is so cool to have adapted is because it's also just a really cool world, and there are so many really cool settings mm-hmm. that I really really want to see. Lyra's world was really really interesting to see how they represented that because I so much of it is not what I would have have pictured. It's not like how I would have designed it, but it was really, really cool to see that. And so I'm excited about that kind of stuff. Um, And there are a couple worlds that we get introduced to in the third Mm. book that I just, just, yeah, I don't know. There are just so many more characters and worlds. and, And I think more than anything, I'm just excited to see those things brought to life. I also hope that there's more Pan and Lyra relationship. Like, I'm actually really sad thinking about this, like, right now. We've talked all this time, and we haven't really talked about Pan, and he's not as important in the series, which is just, like, he meant so much to me as a kid. (laughs) And to be, like, forgetting about him. It's a bummer. It's such a bummer. Well... On that <laughs> note, <laughs> on that bummer of a note, <laughs> here's to hoping we get more pantomime in season two. Thank you so much to Jocelyn for being here and sharing all of these big feelings about his dark materials. And thank you to all of you for listening. If you are enjoying this podcast, we would love it if you consider joining our community on Patreon at patreon.com slash snark squad. We would also love to hear all of your thoughts about his dark materials. There will be a post dedicated to this episode up on snarksquad.com, or you can find us all on Twitter at snark underscore squad. I am at Sweeney Says. You can find me at my name is Marines. And I'm at Jossaraptor. This show is a Snark Squad production. It is edited by me, and the theme music, as always, is by Stefan Chin. Mm-hmm.